Uh, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, uh, who again is from our North American contingent. Uh, this is called uh, medicinal, oh, sorry, medical cannabis legislation: a North American perspective. Uh, Rob Clark, who I'm about to introduce. Uh, will uh, review the success and limitations of various North American approaches to medical cannabis legislation and make some observations pertinent to Australian medical cannabis. Uh, Rob Clark has devoted his entire professional career and much of his personal life to studying the cannabis plant and human cannabis relationships. He is the author of The Botany and Ecology of Cannabis, 1977, Marijuana Botany, 1981 and Hashish 1998 and co-author of Hemp Priests, Hemp Pests, sorry, and Diseases 2000, uh, and Cannabis Evolution and Ethnobotany in 2013. Rob has also written several book chapters and numerous peer-reviewed articles, as well as participating in international conferences. And his work is widely known and recognised by popular audiences, as well as his academic peers. Rob maintains a lengthy working relationship with Horta Farm BV in the Netherlands, specialising in industrial and medicinal cannabis breeding, and continues to serve as projects manager for the International Hemp Association. During the past three decades, Rob has travelled extensively documenting traditional cannabis production and use, increasingly threatened by globalisation and cultural prejudice, and has assembled a comprehensive collection of Eurasian hemp textiles. Rob presently heads Bioagronomics, uh, the Bioagronomics Group, which is an international cannabis consultants, consultancy specialising in, uh, in smoothing the transition into a wholly legal and normalised cannabis market. I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Clark. Well, first I'd like to Thank everyone with United in Compassion. This is a great event, and thank you all for attending. This is, uh, it's important for everybody to learn what's going on from all levels. Um, I'm an ethnobotanist, and ethnobotanists study the relationships between peoples and plants. Um, in this particular case, between the people in this room and the people of the nation of Australia and the cannabis plant. So. This is just a continuation of my general theme in studies. Um, first, I'd just like to point out our, our common goals. Compassion, to help patients find medical relief. This is number one. Access, to empower patients to seek their own medical solutions, which is a larger issue than just cannabis. Security to protect the public with appropriate regulations, and responsibility to keep citizens out of jail and in productive communities. I think we all agree that these are our, our common goals across the planet with anybody trying to, to legitimize and legalize medicinal cannabis. Um, I want to quickly cover what's happened in the US. We have a long history of working towards various different medicinal cannabis legislations. Um, it's a bit of a mess. You, you have a great advantage here. You have a Commonwealth nationwide policy that you can uh, work under. You have your own states and territories, but you, by having a central policy, will, I hope, um, circumvent a lot of the chaos that's going on in America at the moment. We, the best, this sort of divides into five phases of what's gone on with, with medicinal cannabis in America. In a lot of ways, we've regressed from where we started. Um, we have a dozen states now that allow personal use of cannabis, um, but with doctor recommendation, you can't prescribe cannabis in America. It's not part of our America's pharmacopoeia, but doctors can recommend. Um, and for a wide variety of indications. It, it, the states that started out first with this sort of thing don't really limit what cannabis can be used for medicinally. Um, the states provide caregiver rights. The caregivers are protected by law. Um, they allow personal cultivation, which is a very important tenant in providing patient access. And they provide a patient registry in many of these states, which is voluntary in many cases, but 
it allows researchers to know what is going on with those that are using medicinal cannabis. And of these 12 states, nine allow dispensary systems. Um, dispensary systems are a mixed blessing. I don't, I don't encourage you to do this kind of system here. Um, medicinal cannabis here is, as I understand it, to be distributed through the pharmacies, which is uh, probably a very good plan. And as you can see here, the, the amount someone can possess in these states, it varies all over the place and the number of plants that people can grow. So, yeah, with all these positive aspects of these dozen states, the Americans for Safe Access still gives them a C average. This is the highest rating you're going to see in, in this talk. So there's a lot, in their opinion, a lot left to do to ensure that patients can easily get cannabis and make their own decisions about its use. The, the next phase, the next two phases, restrict this somewhat. They have all the same regulations and all the same positive aspects, but they don't allow personal cultivation. And they've started to bring in more restrictions over time. Um, you can only buy a certain amount in a certain time period, rather than using as much medicinal cannabis as you want, depending on personal decision and your, your indication. And in one of these states, you're not allowed to smoke medicinal cannabis, but otherwise you are. Um, they rate a D average. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, we're, we're slipping here as we go on in time. Uh, three more states allow cultivation, but not caregiver rights. So you're okay to grow your own, but your friend can't grow it for you. And a lot of people who use medicinal cannabis are too ill to grow their own cannabis or too old, or bedridden, or just doesn't work out. So having a friend do it for you is a very important key element of providing patient access to medicinal cannabis. Uh, not allowing a caregiver is not quite as bad as not being able to grow it, so they get a D plus. They're, they're really rocking. Um, further restrictions, um, time restricted again. It's another D. Now we have the most recent phenomenon, which uh, is important to see because you're rescheduling, not descheduling, but rescheduling your cannabis compounds. You, you're rescheduling THC to schedule eight in your system, but reverse from the way they've numbered it in the UN, but it's the same system. Um, it's been removed to schedule eight, which allows uh, research and other, other good prospects. And CBD is being considered completely differently. It's non-psychoactive, not considered uh, to have so much abuse potential. And that's been removed to Schedule 4, which allows a lot more to happen. I'll go over this briefly in a moment. Um, these 18 states that have allowed CBD have done it very recently. It is based on misdirected compassion, all right? These Children, largely intractable epilepsy. It's one of the few things that, that's, that uh, cannabis has been approved for in these CBD states. They've all come online in the last less than two years. And if you throw them in, we have more than 40 states that are technically medicinal cannabis states. But this is not accurate. These states are completely dysfunctional. Some of the laws even say that doctors must prescribe, prescribe, Cannabis, that's not possible. So these situations are completely dysfunctional. Um, we've learned some difficult lessons, or are learning some difficult lessons from the American scene. What we're seeing is that the medicinal cannabis concept has been horribly abused. Um, th this is why I'm suggesting that you all work out your, your own system and don't follow America. You, you have other Commonwealth nations you can, uh, can uh, take example from. Why I say that, that medical cannabis is a gateway issue is because what it's really done is alert people to a bigger issue, which is that people need to be free to make their own medical decisions, including the use of medicinal cannabis. And this has brought awareness to this bigger issue and to the general legalization of, of cannabis for whatever uses. Um, it's been a work in progress after 30 years. It still is. Don't expect immediate results, but certainly don't expect it to take as long as it, 
is taking in America. Um, we also have learned that cannabis use is safe. We've, call it what you want, but we've uh, crowdsourced this information. No one's died from a marijuana overdose. It it's really does not have much abuse potential at all. And should it leak out here and there, it's not resulting in the deaths of German tourists. This is not what's happening. So in addition to this, it's very difficult for people to realize this, that, that it really is a harmless plant, it's easily grown, um, it can be grown very clean and, and free and safe of heavy metals and pesticides and, and uh, contaminants, biological contaminants. That we, we need to be free of these, but it's not a difficult process to do this. And as I mentioned before, the closer we've come to the eventual public acceptance of cannabis in general, the more difficult the medicinal thrust has become. The terrain has become really pitted and full of obstacles. So I'll give you a little advice in the, in the minute here, but don't let it linger. Get on with what you're doing. Cannabis is not a cure-all. It mostly, it, it, fact, matter of fact, it, in most cases, 90% of cases, cannabis doesn't really cure anything. But it makes the relief of symptomology and conditions that go along with the diseases is, is profound. And possibly one thing that's limited us is because it's not a cure all for even, or a, just a cure for one disease at this point. It's in a, an odd palliative care sort of realm where we, it is an issue of compassion. We're, we're helping people have a better life, but we're not necessarily curing them of their diseases. Much of medicine is like this. But at the same time, we don't have the horrible side effects that almost all single bullet, single compound pharmaceuticals have. And in that regard, we've also learned that cannabis is most effective in most cases as a, a broad spectrum extract, not trying to find a silver bullet from this plant. Um, isolated compounds work, but the entire um, entourage effect is more important in the efficacy of cannabis. And unfortunately, the same people who have been fighting for their rights for all these years, in a lot of these states, they can't self-medicate, and they can't even grow a few plants. So just because you're right doesn't mean you are uh, empowered to do what you want to do. And another situation is that we really can't, um, as the medicinal cannabis community, we can't really wait for a medical system to do what needs to be done, which are clinical trials. I can't as a scientist say that we shouldn't do clinical trials, but this will be a very slow and expensive process that's been pointed out a couple of times today already. And those who are already experimenting with cannabis in illegally can't really wait for these clinical trials to prove that there is a, a medical advantage to cannabis. We already know this. So, Regulated and taxed cannabis sales reduce law enforcement costs and social costs. This has shown up in every state that's, that's legalized it. And in these states that have dispensaries, have legal sales points, cannabis sales are a super lucrative source of state revenue. This is money that can be used for good things, like financing further research on medicinal cannabis. So don't, don't ignore that. I want to take a quick look at uh, countries that might actually be more important to your situation than America. Jamaica has, has moved towards adult use. This is the term I prefer for uh, saying that adults can choose what they want to do with cannabis. It really, the state tries to make it their business, and they must because that's their, their regulatory bodies. They're there to protect us, but there's, they're, standing in the way of just getting on with it. There is no medicinal cannabis policy in Jamaica. You're allowed, any citizen under the new rules is allowed to possess two ounces, 56 grams of cannabis. Um, possession of more than that's an offense. 
unless you use it for religious purposes, Rastafarianism, or you're a medicinal user, or you're a researcher, you're exempt from these very simple rules um, just because on those grounds. It doesn't involve much paperwork. If you're fined uh, an equivalent of five Australian dollars, you pay it to the tax office. So this is a revenue gaining uh, move. It, it's not a legislative or law enforcement move. They're, they're not really linked. And Jamaica uses one system, as I pointed out. It's really an adult use, adult responsibility system, and they're not trying to invoke any medicinal plan. Canada, which mentioned in the last talk, um, they're moving along. Um, the, the situation exists the way it is because there's a suit uh, against the Queen or to be against the Commonwealth in general that is allowing people to provide their own medicine at this time. This is uh, being fought, um, it, but it's becoming a moot point. I mean, Trudeau has just come out uh, two weeks ago and said that by this time next year, they will have in place, or be working on having in place, an adult use system. This is going to contravene the medical system in many ways. And this is eventually what's going to happen in America. You, you will be able to make decisions. This is what the people want. This is a democracy. And eventually, this will happen if Australia follows the pattern that other Western nations are following. And there's no reason to think that this won't happen. Um, okay. It's back to the bigger issue. So, this is how it was until recently in Australia. And I'm, I'm not an expert on these things. I'm certainly not a lawyer. But I did read your rules and try to understand uh, where they stood, where they stand now, and where they possibly could go based on what it says in your nine tiered scheduling of. of uh, medicinal and other poisonous substances in, in, uh, in Australia. You need a permit, otherwise it's restricted. A lot of this was just gone over. I'm, I'm going to go quickly here. You can only use it for research purposes the way it was, and any research had to be recognized and approved by an a uh, ethics committee. Um, oddly enough, Schedule 9 is uh, Cannabis is bedfellows with some incredibly psychoactive compounds that are uh, really not comparable to cannabis. Um, they're largely hallucinogens. They're also derived from plants and fungi. Um, the beginnings have come around to rescheduling here. And so Schedule 8 will allow more research, res ease restrictions a bit, but these are still compounds that have a high potential for abuse and addiction. That's not cannabis, all right? It's, I'll just quote here from Francis Young first, 1988. He was the Department of the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration and America's Chief Administrative Law Judge. And Francis Young said, in strict medical terms, marijuana is far safer than many foods we commonly consume. Marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. By any measure of rational analysis, marijuana can be safely used within the supervised routine of medical care. And we could uh, hear from a doctor as, as well about this. I mean, it, in a moment we will. But look at what's gone on in all the millions of dollars that could have been better spent on cannabis research started with the United Nations and, and almost all Western nations following in, and 45 years of spending hundreds of millions of dollars, they haven't found anything wrong with cannabis, okay? These are real researchers really trying to find something wrong. And if they can't find anything of significant worry, why are we worried? You know, our peers have spent decades trying to find things wrong, and they can't. So, more about Schedule 8, it's uh, also a lot of uh, 
odd bedfellows, but nabilone, a synthetic THC analog, and dronabinol, which is synthetic THC identical to the natural form, are also included in Schedule 8. I found that interesting. But right along with amphetamines, your biggest drug problem, fentanyl, uh, uh, synthetic heroin that's incredibly toxic and, and dangerous, GHB, a date rate drug, and oxycodone, which you make from your Thebane poppies. But, so it's all a bit mixed up here, you know, odd circumstances. And that's what regulators like Bill Turner are trying to work out. This is not an easy system for him to work through either. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's daunting. So then you have Schedule 4, and, th and this is where uh, CBD has been sent or will be sent soon. Good move. Um, THC should probably be there also. Um, it still requires professional monitoring and, uh, and, and responsibility by practitioners to make sure that, uh, that it's not abused. Even not that there's any abuse potential, but they're still protecting the citizens, which is good. Um, Schedule three is interesting. Pharmacist only medicines. Um, these are for ailments that can be identified by the consumer, which is what's going on right now with medicinal cannabis, the consumer and their practitioner from time to time. Um, and a verified pharmacist can even advise you, which is uh, interesting that the Commonwealth system is your chemists here. You're not uh, pharmacists. So that's interesting. You have a lot of uh, leeway to do things yourselves, which we don't in America. Um, then you have a couple other schedules. Schedule two, pharmacy medicines again, it's substantially safe in use, but where advice or counseling is advisable, available if necessary and, and advisable too. These are simple things like cough suppressants, antihistamines and over the counter drugs we really don't worry about. And then this very interesting schedule one, complementary medicines or traditional alternative medicines. Cannabis falls in here well too. It, uh, it, it's really more the way people use medicinal cannabis than any of these other schedules. So, and it noted in there that Schedule 1 is set aside for possible future use. So maybe we should think about this. You know, it's, it's a good way when we've gained confidence with cannabis to, to continue rescheduling and eventually descheduling. But all right, talked about this already. Schedule four's thing. Um, potential problems here are the same as everywhere. Overregulating a benign plant because we're afraid of it and, and squandering the medical efficacy that we can have right now is, is a problem. And, and all nations are facing this. Um, waiting for clinical trials which the pharmaceutical realm needs and they they will perform if they decide that there's a profit motive in there for them they're not going to do it because they're altruistic and there's really little intellectual property right in cannabis so don't count on pharmaceutical companies doing these clinical trials for your benefit they may get done and some will be done by the by the commonwealth and it's not all totally profit driven, but much of it is. And it, it, we really just can't wait for isolated compounds to be shown to be efficacious while handcuffing those who are already medicating. So it's, it's not right. And you also have the, the situation now of ignoring the fact that flowers, whole flowers are very effective medicine. You're about to jump right over this, it seems to me, and go to, to forms that are striving for pharmaceutical forms that don't yet exist and won't for years. And it's fearing cannabis is, we're smarter than that. We have enough body of evidence that we don't have to be afraid of cannabis. It's not hurting us. And, also, you waste a lot of resources with a dual system. If eventually you're going to move to adult use, then maybe you should just get on with it, protect medical users in the interim as best we can, and don't deny the inevitable shift, inevitable shift to adult use. This is 
I would predict where we're headed. So. So I'll give a few suggestions here. Remember, I'm an American, and my suggestions may not be so appropriate to you, but I've, I tried to keep them general so that they'd work anywhere. We need to accept. We need to accept that cannabis is generally beneficial and not dangerous. We need to establish logical regulations that benefit and protect all citizens, especially ones who are trying to medicate, but everyone. And, and along these lines, don't forget that everyone who has a vested interest in cannabis should be allowed to participate. You know, whether that's bureaucracy, law enforcement, all the people you'd rather they didn't have to participate, but until things are worked out, don't try to shut anybody out of this. Don't try to shut out the pharmacy companies. They're bigger than us, all of them. Let sleeping dogs lie and get on with what we can do without looking for trouble. And as I've said all along, avoid linking medicinal cannabis availability to clinical trials. This will slow it down so far, and it just, it, it's an improper path to really getting medicine to the people. And most importantly, you need to educate people. You, people fear because they don't understand. And you, we need to advance cannabis through the dissemination of information. This, is, this has been the theme of the International Hemp Association since 1993, and, and it's really important. That's why I write books. It's an educational mission. It's not to make money. It's to get the information out there. So feel free to plagiarize me all you want. You know, it, it, just use the material. Get on with it. And we need to address the important social issues. It, it, it's two things, it's adult cannabis use, but it's personal medical choice. You know, it, it's, we herbally medicate all the time. We, people are just aren't uptight about chamomile tea because it doesn't make you high, okay? But that's, we need to normalize cannabis. So it's like any other herbal drug and we need to experiment with it, find the, the pharmaceutical uses, but just get on with making it a normalized plant and educating the people and uh, providing access to everyone who needs it. And that's it. I I'm gonna forego questions because we're trying to move on with this program, but I'm around here this afternoon and all day tomorrow. And please tackle me, knock me down and t interrogate me. So you're good. Thank you very much.